Good morning, Emmanuel. God is good all the time. Let's pray together. Lord, we come this morning and we praise you, Lord. Our desire is to worship you, Lord. We pray right now that you would, Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place. We ask you to get our heart right. We acknowledge sometimes, Lord, we're not right. So we just pray, Lord, you would be working in this room and getting our hearts right and our minds right. As we go to our worship call, Lord, we, we enter your gates with thanksgiving. We're so thankful for the opportunity that you have given us to come together weekly to hear your word, to worship you. Lord, we pray especially right now for Friday night as this worship night in our community takes place that we would come here freely and worship you out of a gratefulness and a thankfulness. Thank you for every young person, every student here that they bind together, that they love one another. And we, we just ask your blessing, Lord. We praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, men, in the spirit of praise, pardon me, all right, ladies and gentlemen, in the spirit of praise, in the spirit of praise, when we start our kingdom call, starting right here with you, Kai Stevens, a junior high man, hey, we want to go one time through. Show up the first time for your tribe. Stand up. Let's go. Stand up. Thank you, and together, and together. God is faithful. Guys, thank you. We have an amazing day. We're going to start with a little bit of information. Go ahead and sit down, please, on OCC. All right, good morning, you guys. I just want to show you all really quickly what a completed box will look like, okay? We'll be giving you guys these boxes. Some of you may already have some. Sunglasses here. I'm going to put these sunglasses in the box. All right, so this is the idea. We've got a stuffed animal, we've got a pair of socks, we've got the deflated soccer ball, right? Calculator. These are like two dollars on Amazon. Yo-yos, a dollar at Dollar Tree. A little pop bracelet. Sewing kit, Dollar Tree, right by the registers. Okay. Crayons, Dollar Tree, Dollar Tree. Dominoes, Dollar Tree. Got this bouncy ball, it's really cool. Right? Who wouldn't want that? Ooh. Dollar Tree. Get the idea? A little etch a sketch, Dollar Tree. Notebook, Dollar Tree. Okay? Pencils, pens, toothbrushes. If you guys buy a pack of six toothbrushes, break them up, put one in each box, put it in a Ziploc. Pencils, pens. Here's the pump. Make sure you tape the needle to the pump. So the needle doesn't get lost. Okay, that's super important. All right, so pencil sharpener. You guys, I still have 100 pencil sharpeners in my room. Please come buy them. Okay, 100 pencil sharpeners. That's the idea. Glue sticks. You guys, you can get so much great stuff. I think I did this whole box for about $20. The soccer ball is the biggest thing. It was $9 off Amazon. But you guys, you can do this. It's not complicated. And then you stuff it all in. The only thing we don't pack, well, there's lots of things. But besides, the things on the list is air. No air in the boxes. Fill them up, okay? You guys got this. Thank you. Awesome. And as Pastor Whelan is in his uh, final day here, I want to tell you guys, when, when we were thinking about March Forward and the theme about what it means as Christians to follow the example of Jesus Christ, and we're providing activity for you like gleanings, which by the way, they, they appreciate what you guys have done and the report from gleanings is positive. What you guys are doing with OCC, this Friday night, again, we don't have worship today and we know our worship is fantastic and, and honors the Lord, but we have this opportunity this Friday night where not only our worship team, 
but our alumni is going to be here, and we're asking that every, every person will try to be here, and you will get points Friday night. With all that said, when we thought about Pastor Whelan coming to share, we knew he was a man that's not only out spreading the gospel, but he's discipling people, the Great Commission. And today he's going to really do a fantastic job of helping us be ready to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be part of God's mission on this earth. Pastor, I'm so thankful. Guys, students, Pastor has come down here two weeks, poured into us. Some of you have come to faith in Christ, and today he's going to put the, the final message and give us practice in sharing the gospel. I just want to ask everybody if you would clap it up to show Pastor Whelan how much you're louder. We appreciate Pastor. Thank you. We really appreciate you. So when you come into a place, you always want to know the lay of the land. What tribe was the champion last year? Oh. Who's going to win it this year? Okay. Just from enthusiasm, I heard Jaira and Shamas. We'll see how that all works out. Let me pray for us. Lord, so grateful for the students. Encourage them today. We're so grateful for the teachers here. Encourage them. Bless them in every way. It's all in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Albert Einstein was going off to this speaking engagement. He was riding on this train. His mind was preoccupied about many things, but all of a sudden, the train conductor came around punching tickets, and Einstein realized, I don't know where my ticket is. So he started checking his, his coat pockets, and then he looked in his briefcase, and the train conductor could tell he was having a problem. He said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. Everyone on this train knows who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. I know who you are. Well, the train conductor continued to the back of the train, punching people's tickets. He looked back at Albert Einstein. Now, Albert Einstein was on his hands and his knees looking for his train ticket. And the conductor came back and said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. Everyone on this train knows who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. I know who you are. Albert Einstein said, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> Do you know where you're going? The Bible says in Hebrews, it is appointed a man once to die and after that to face the judgment. So the common factor about everyone here today is you're going to end up in one of two places. You're going to end up in heaven or hell. I think about one of my soldiers during the Iraq war. He said this to me in the most dangerous city in the world where soldiers were dying left and right. He said, chaplain, when I'm driving through the streets of Iraq and the bullets are flying over my head, if something were to happen to me, I don't know what would happen to me. I do not know where I would go. And it gave me an opportunity to witness to him. We need to know where we're going to go when we die. And the Bible talks about that. I've titled today's talk, God's Roadmap to Heaven. So for the next 18 minutes, I want to talk about that. Then I'm going to give basically a one-minute break, have our tribal leaders come forward, and I'm going to pass out a handout for everyone in your tribe, and then you're going to practice what I talk about in today's message. So... I want you to think about the number one question that your family members ask. Maybe your brother or sister, even you years ago, would ask on a family vacation. It probably was, are we there yet? I think that's the number one question people ask during a sermon or a chapel talk. Are we there yet? When is this going to be over? Today, in the next 18 minutes, we're going to make four stops. And again... You're going to be practicing what I talk about today. So make sure you're tracking with me on this trip. Stop number one, God's roadmap takes us to our sin. The Bible says in Romans 3 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is sin? Sin is anything we do, say, or think that displeases God. And the common factor about all of us here today is that all of us have sinned against God. Now, I think about where I was years ago in 2015. Our family went to Long Beach, California for a pastor's conference. And at this pastor's conference, after it was over, we went to the ocean. What would happen? Just imagine this. We're not going to do this. Some of you would be too excited. If I said, chapel is over now, you'd get too excited. We're going to Long Beach, California. Everyone take off your socks and your shoes. Get in the ocean on the count of three. One, two, three. We're going to jump to Tokyo, Japan. Well, if I said that, most of us on the count of three, one, two, three, we could jump maybe four feet or five feet in the ocean towards Tokyo, but no one here, even if you're an all-state athlete on track and field in the long jump, none of you could jump from Long Beach to Tokyo, Japan. We'd all fall short in the same way. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. His standard is perfection. Jesus says, be perfect as the heavenly Father is perfect. But we've all fallen short. We fall short of the glory of God. So stop number one. God's roadmap takes us to our sin. Stop number two. God's roadmap takes us to our sentence. This is when Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. He's talking about hell. Did you know that Jesus talked more about hell than any other person? In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, or there'll be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Think about that when you are a little child, or you have a younger brother and sister. And they start crying. Something happens and they start crying. Usually after a few minutes, they stop crying and they're comforted. But you know what the Bible says about hell? That hell is a place where grown men and women and teenagers will cry for all of eternity. And there will be no one to comfort them there. The best illustration I could think of in my life of hell and what it would be like is the gas chamber. When I was 22 years old, after graduating from college in Chicago, right before I went to graduate school in Texas, I had to go off to advanced camp for the United States Army in Fort Lewis, Washington. And if any of you have a family member that's been a part of the United States military, not only thank them, but also ask them, tell me about your experience in the gas chamber. I guarantee it was awful for them, because what they'd have you do is they'd have you take off your gas mask, you are in the gas chamber, and then you walk out and everyone's just crying and yelling and shrieking, and everyone is weeping, from the tallest of the cadets to the shortest, all different shapes and sizes of the American soldiers. Once you come out of that and you're in the gas chamber, everyone is crying and weeping, and it felt like razors were slashing your throat, and I thought to myself, this is what hell is going to be like. In fact, you may know the Bible very well, but none of us here can possibly imagine how awful of a place hell is going to be. And most of the world is traveling to hell. Jesus says that in Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter, when he said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. The common factor of the world today, most of the world is headed for hell. Most of the world is not headed for heaven, but the great news is God wants everyone to go to heaven. I think of what Paul says in 1 Timothy, the second chapter. God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So the common factor of everyone you'll ever meet in your life, regardless of their age, regardless of their past, regardless of their skin color, God wants everyone to go to heaven. The Apostle Peter talks about it when he says the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The common fact you know about the world, regardless of age and skin color and what someone's done in their past, 
God wants everyone to experience eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. But the fact of the matter is, most of the world is headed for the highway to hell. The freeway to fire. But you know what's amazing to me? What Jesus says. And again, Jesus talked more about hell than any other person. He says in Matthew chapter 25 that God prepared hell for the devil and his angels. Isn't that amazing? God never prepared hell, according to Matthew 25, for people. He doesn't want anyone to go there. But there is a real place called hell. It is our sentence. It is what we deserve because God's standard to get into heaven is perfection, but we've all fallen short. So secondly, stop number two, God's roadmap takes us to our sentence. Stop number three, God's roadmap takes us to our substitute. And I think of what Paul says, and it was a verse that really spoke to me because maybe you're saying, Pastor, I've never struggled with this. But I think about when I was in college. And I was struggling with anxiety and depression. And I was stressed out. And I thought, why am I having so many problems in my life? Maybe God doesn't really love me. And I believe that even here today, in every section, there are students that feel that way. You may be going through a difficult time in your life. But I promise you, whatever you're going through, Jesus understands. Jesus can relate to what you're going through. You know what the Bible says prophetically about Jesus 700 years before he was born in the book of Isaiah? It says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and familiar with suffering. Jesus knows what it's like to be lonely. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. Jesus knows what it's like to have such pain Fill your heart. Jesus understands exactly what you're going through. But I had questions. Why am I having so many problems in my life? Does God really love me? And immediately when I had that thought, Romans 5, 8 came to my mind. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So if you're going through a difficult time in your life right now, and you wonder... Does God really love me? Does he care about me? Is he interested in me? Through the cross of Christ, God is saying, yes, I love you. I care about you. I'm interested in you. So whenever you see a symbol of the cross, God is saying, I love you. I care about you. I'm interested in you. But think about it in the context of your family. Maybe you mess up and there's going to be a punishment. Your phone is taken away. Or social media privilege is taken away. There is a punishment. But what would happen if one of your family members would come through and say, you know what? I love my brother or sister so much, I don't want them to have that punishment. I'll take that. What would they be doing? They'd be substituting in your place. That's what Jesus did. Our sentence is hell. That's what we deserve. But Jesus said no. I love them so much, I want to substitute in their place. I want to take their punishment upon myself. The reason Jesus went to the cross of Christ was to substitute in my place and your place so that when we die, we don't have to go to hell. He substituted. Only his shed blood washes away our sin. And he rose again on the third day, which leads to the fourth and final stop. God's roadmap takes us to our salvation. This is mind-boggling when you think about it. When Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Did you know that it was that verse? That was a verse of assurance for the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken. At KFC, Colonel Sanders was the founder. At 79 years old, he walked into this church. He was a good person, a moral person, but he lacked the assurance of salvation until he was in this church in Louisville, Kentucky. And he heard Romans, the 10th chapter, 
the ninth verse, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And he claimed that verse, and he had the assurance of salvation. Did you know that's one of the reasons the Bible is written? Was to give the Christian the assurance of salvation. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not hope so, maybe so, think so. God wants you to have the assurance of salvation. If you were to die tonight, you'd know for certain you'd go to heaven. That's one of the reasons the Bible is written. According to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, where Paul goes on to say this, my favorite verse in the Bible, a message the whole world needs to hear. Romans 10, 13. For whoever, I have the confidence in any situation I'm in in the world, Regardless of whether I'm preaching in a prison or to the U.S. military, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, period. Paul goes on to say, how can they call on the one they've not believed in? So you may be saying, how do I know if I believed in Christ? Have you called on the name of Jesus Christ and asked him for salvation? That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. I think of the thief on the cross. Remember what he said? Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was a thief. And what did Jesus say? I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I want to encourage you. Call on Jesus Christ for salvation. He was, is, and always will be the only way of salvation. He says of himself in the Greek. Ego me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Or Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Or the classic text that refutes Islam, 1 Timothy, the second chapter, the fifth verse, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Why not today? Call on Jesus Christ for salvation. He was, is, and always will be the only hope, the only way of salvation for the world. So today, I titled the message, God's Roadmap to Heaven. We just made four stops in this trip. Remember, stop number one. God's Roadmap takes us to our sin. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Our sentence, that's stop number two. God's road that takes us our sentence. Our sentence, what we deserve for our sin, is hell. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. That's why he sent Jesus. Stop number three. God's roadmap takes us to our substitute. Jesus substituted on the cross for our sins. Only his blood washes away our sin. He substituted for you and me because he loves us. And then finally... He rose from the dead. Stop number four. God's roadmap takes us to our salvation. D.L. Moody made a mistake. He was the greatest evangelist of 150 years ago. Every person here today has more education than D.L. Moody. He only had a fifth grade education. He butchered the English language, and yet he became a Christian. He moved to Chicago. His English grammar was terrible, but he had a heart to reach the poor and the hurting kids of Chicago. He started a Sunday school class with basically zero in the inner city of Chicago. It grew to about 600. It caught the attention of President-elect Abraham Lincoln, who came to see D.L. Moody's Sunday school class in Chicago. But D.L. Moody made a terrible mistake. Think if you'd ever make a mistake like this. It was October 8th. 1871, he was preaching to his largest audience in Chicago in a message titled, The Most Important Issue in the World, What Will You Do With Jesus Called the Christ? He was tired, just like I asked a few days ago. Some of you are tired after the time change. He was tired. He said, I'm going to give you a week to think this over. The song leader, the worship team came up, and then the sirens started blaring in Chicago. It was the Chicago fire. Over 100,000 people lost their homes. And people died in the Chicago fire. People that were there that night to listen to him preach. He thought I made the biggest mistake ever. I never gave the evangelistic invitation. 
So whenever someone invites me, I always give the evangelistic invitation because you may never have another chance. I think about speaking to my soldiers in the very same place that Saddam Hussein was born in where we captured him when I was your age. He said he would make the Americans swim in their blood. And I was scared when I was your age about the war in Iraq. I ended up going there. And there I was years ago preaching to the soldiers of Iraq. And I shared this message with one of our soldiers. I said, would you like to call on Jesus Christ for salvation right here and now at Saddam Hussein's Air Force Base? He started crying. It made sense to him. But he wasn't ready. A few months later, he was killed by a roadside bomb. My prayer for you, I know these are not the roads of Iraq, but none of us know when we're going to die. Why not call on Jesus Christ for salvation today? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call out your name. I'm not going to call you forward. With all eyes closed and heads bowed, maybe you're saying, Pastor, I've never called on Jesus Christ for salvation before, but today I want to call on Jesus for salvation if that's you, I will not embarrass you. I will not call out your name. I will not call you forward. But you're saying, today, Pastor, I've never called on Jesus, but today I want to call on Jesus for salvation. If that's you, I won't embarrass you, but would you slip up your hand? Yes, anyone else? down. And in the privacy of your heart, for those that responded that raised their hands, I want to encourage you to pray this. In the privacy of your heart and privacy of your seat. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, please forgive me for all of my sin. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. Lord Jesus Christ, Save me. Come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And with all eyes open, I want to encourage you. If you made that decision today, I want to encourage you to share that with your teachers. They'd love to hear from you. They do love you very much, and they care very much for you. And share that with some of the student leaders here that are really living for Christ. I'm so proud of you for being here. At this time, I need all of the tribal leaders. All eight tribes, I want to see you right here. All eight tribes, let's go. Tribal leaders, I want to see all eight right up here. You're going to pass out these evangelistic training sheets. 